Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus in Hong Kong. Thank you for joining our program, New Digital Methods in East Asian Studies. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the U Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you all to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest UN campus programs and information. Or you can also follow our U Chicago UN campus Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and our new channel on LinkedIn. We'll wrap up tonight's program with a poll and more information about our upcoming events, so please be sure to stay until the very end. Computer power is allowing scholars of East Asian history and culture to approach their subjects in new and revealing ways. Tonight, we'll hear from three practitioners who are especially innovative in their use of technology to bring insights into the field. Our U Chicago UN Campus Hong Kong faculty director, Professor Kenneth Pomerantz, will be moderating tonight's program. Professor Pomerantz is a distinguished university professor of modern Chinese history and in the college. Professor Pomerantz's work focuses mostly on China, and he's also very interested in comparative and world history. Most of his research is in social, economic, and environmental history. He's also worked on state formation, imperialism, religion, gender, and other topics. Thanks for joining early this morning, Ken. I'll turn the stage over to you. Have a fascinating conversation. Thanks very much, Mark, and hi, everybody. So let me quickly introduce our panel. Um, I'm actually going to introduce them in the reverse order from the order that they're going to speak in. Um, and I do want to note that they are all University of Chicago PhDs and two of the three of them work at the university today. So this is, we're really showing off ourselves tonight or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, professor Susan Burns is professor of Japanese history and East Asian languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. Um, after a previous life as an intellectual historian, she now works on the history of gender, medicine, and public health in early modern and modern Japan. Um, her recent work includes Kingdom of the Sick, a history of leprosy and Japan, gender and law in the Japanese imperial, imperium, and sexual violence in the evidential body, forensic medicine, gender, and the courts in modern Japan, which is a special issue on part of a special issue on medicine and the law. She's currently completing another book entitled Cartographies of Care, Medicine and Public Health in Tokyo, 1868 to 1912. Um, professor James Z. Lee is Yanai Foundation Professor of Social Science and Chair Professor of Humanities at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's a social science historian. He has served as John Simon Guggenheim Fellow in Sociology at the University of Michigan and as Changjiang Professor of Sociology at Beida. Professor Li is the author or co-author of eight academic books and 80 plus articles. Um, he's also- we like What? We like what? Eight. In Hong Kong, we like the number eight. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, in general, in China. Um, he's also been the recipient or co-recipient of 11 prizes for books, articles, and projects from the Social Science History Association, the American Sociological Association, and from organizations in both China and Japan as well. He's the founding co-editor of Late Imperial China, probably the leading journal in the field, um, which he co-edited from 1985 to 2000. He teaches social science scientific history regularly to a global audience through his Coursera course, Understanding China, 1700 to 2000. And he is a second generation graduate of the University of Chicago, along with his father, brother, and some other family members. <laughs> um, and I would also note has been just an extraordinarily generous colleague to a number of us as we have made our way into this field over the years. Jeffrey Tarson is Associate Technology Director of Digital Studies 
serving as the university-wide technical domain expert for digital and computational approaches to humanistic inquiry. Humanistic here, including a large chunk of the social sciences as well. He received his PhD in 2015 from University of Chicago's East Asian Languages and Civilizations Department and specializes in the fields of pre-modern Chinese philology, phonology, poetics, and paleography. In his current work, he leads teams that are creating new computational resources, platforms and methods for humanistic research, designing curricula and teach, teaches courses on advanced data science, deep learning, and multilingual natural language processes. He serves on thesis committees and mentors students interested in developing new digital and computational research methods. And I would say um, has been, again, remarkably generous with people at very, very different levels of their learning in this area. Um, Jeffrey regularly presents his research at national and international conferences, serves on committees devoted to developing advanced technologies for the humanities. Um, he's received a Fulbright Award for his Digital Etymological Dictionary of Old Chinese, a new type of software suite which facilitates large-scale analyses of early Chinese phonetics and phonorhetoric. And his first monograph, Chinese Euphonics, is due to be published in 2023, I believe. Um, so welcome to everybody. And um, Jeffrey, we'll start with you tonight or this morning. Take your choice. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ken. This is indeed early morning here in Chicago. Uh, I hope everyone is well wherever uh, the webinar may find you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen, and we're going to jump in more or less right away. Uh, in the interest of time, I am going to go a little bit quickly, and uh, I will hopefully be able to post everything into the chat so that you can run many of these things yourself. I do think it's important when you're doing this kind of work to hand it off, basically. It's in the computer world what we call open source programming. And the idea is that you build things and then you hand them off to the world and you see what the world can do with them. So today we're going to see things that I've done with the tools that we've developed here at the University of Chicago. Uh, and then uh, we can hopefully talk perhaps in the Q&A about where this all goes. So uh, again, thank you to Professor Pomerantz and the Chicago Hong Kong Center for hosting this. Uh, it's really exciting, at least for me, the uh, young kid on the block here uh, to be among such erudite scholars. Uh, we produce some pretty amazing people here at the university. So let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, oh, all right, it messed up my formatting, but that's okay. Uh, the, the Digital Etymological Dictionary of Old Chinese is the right place to start with all of this. So we're going to do some pre-modern Chinese phonology. And uh, I'm going to go ahead, if I can, and put the link to the dictionary I developed right here in the chat. And what you can do with this type, this is really digital lexicography. What you can do is you can take digital texts and then you can use essentially databases of dictionaries and have each character in the text parsed algorithmically and the information from the variety of dictionaries presented to the user. And the fun thing for me is here we're in the world of pre-modern Chinese and not just pre-modern, we're all the way back in the Shizhou Shaddai, we're in the Western Zhou dynasty, right? And so what we can look at are potentially the sounds of these works, some of the most classic works, some of the most important works, you could argue, in the Chinese tradition, and ask the question, what did they actually sound like? So when I first came to the University of Chicago, uh, I met with Ed Shaughnessy, who's my mentor and advisor through all this. And... Uh, I was talking to Ed about the Western Zhou dynasty and I said, we have these texts. We know from Guo Moro and Wang Guowei that these were rhyming texts. Um, Wolfgang Baer most recently did a great deal of work. How do we know what they sounded like? And Ed kind of frowned and he said, you know, we don't actually know exactly. We haven't done perhaps enough work 
uh, in the area of historical linguistics combined with Chinese philology really trained on the very beginnings of the narrative tradition in Chinese. Uh, what do you think you know, your contribution might be? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a software engineer. I'm a computer scientist. And there's no reason why we can't build things that would help us understand what the sounds of ancient Chinese were, not just one graph at a time, the way that Duan Yitzai and Wang Yansun were doing it, but the way that Tiang Yu Gao was doing it in the Qing dynasty. And that means taking entire texts and looking at them in their entirety and trying to figure out where the sound patterns are and where we find other evidence for sometimes puns or homophones, uh, ways that the language was being used artistically and creatively by the authors of these texts. And so what you have here is the interface from the dictionary. You can paste any text in there. Here we've got Guanzhu, of course, the first poem in the Shijing, and it will give you whatever phonological data out of the various databases you would like. And I'll apologize here, we have a number of databases that are not available online that we'll hopefully be bringing online in the next few months. All right, so <clears throat> we can do this. And what, what does it get us, right? Where do we go with this? What it gets us is stuff like this. When you do the color coding of Guanju, these boxes around the rhyme words have been known for probably since the poem was originally conceived of or sung in ancient China. So we know the rhymes, we know how the rhymes work, we know what they are. But there's a number of phonological data, there's, a, there's just a huge amount of other information that's here hidden in the poem. And the only way to find it is by doing all of the phonology of the entire work and then looking and seeing what it gets you. Uh, I'll just highlight one very quickly the center stanza here in this poem is really quite remarkable. As you can see, it's not in exactly the same phonological structure as the other stanzas. And it's the one where the author speaks of turning over and over, feeling unsettled as ostensibly he is pursuing the object of his desires here, right? And there is a double rhyme in this middle stanza that comes right at the beginning. It's the first two lines of this stanza. Most people, when they read this poem, don't realize it's a double rhyme because, of course, in modern Mandarin, it's Buddha and then Sifu, right? Those don't rhyme at all. But in ancient Chinese, they were a perfect rhyme. And this is the type of work that we can do when we run an etymological dictionary at scale. Other things you can do are look at things like the Western Zhou bronze inscriptions. So here we have the Dao Yuding, the Liang Qizong. These are two of our most famous inscriptions from the Western Zhou. And these are the rhyme schemes as determined by uh, the algorithm with, a, of course, uh, an end user to check that the algorithm is doing it correctly. And then we can use works like the Shangshu. This is the Kanggao from the Shangshu. This is where the rhymes are in the Kanggao. So what we can find when we apply these methods is really exciting to those of us who work on ancient Chinese. In middle Chinese, we, it works just as well as long as you use the databases and the phonological data for middle Chinese. So here we have perhaps the most famous poem by Du Fu. This is Zhong Wang. So when Du Fu wrote this poem, all of these lines rhymed perfectly. And we know that they rhymed partly because we have commentaries from the Tang Dynasty, thankfully, that tell us about this. But what if I, the modern reader, want to hear the poem in the ancient pronunciation? What, what can I do? Well, if I can read the IPA, if I can read the phonological data, I can read it out loud myself. But what if I'm someone who can't read the phonological data? The other thing that we've been doing these days is taking this type of an interface and running it through a sound synthesizer to try to hear what the poem would have sounded like in the ancient period. So if I run this in modern Chinese, and I'll just do the first line, it sounds something like this. 
山河在，重称草木山。感时花渐累，恨别鸟惊心。烽火连三月，家书递万金。白头搔更短，困欲不胜烦。All right, so every school child has probably heard that version of the poem read in modern Chinese, in, in modern Mandarin, if you're in a Mandarin speaking part. And I apologize to all of our Cantonese speakers. Uh, I grew up with a close friend who spoke Cantonese and his family spoke Cantonese. So reading it in Cantonese is, of course, much better. But what if we could approximate the sounds of the Tang Dynasty? We can, as a matter of fact, and that's what this lower box represents, is it's how the algorithm can be trained on the phonetics from Middle Chinese to try to produce something appro approximating what it would have sounded like in the Tang Dynasty. So let's go ahead and run that real quick. Now, what you'll notice, of course, is that it sounds like, uh, for those of you who remember the 1980s, it sounds like war games, right? It sounds like the computer voice uh, of old. And that's because this is a very old system. But with the Amazon Alexa and the Google Home devices, we're getting better and better voices for these things. And the hope is that as that technology improves, we can have essentially a real approximation of a voice from the Tang Dynasty in a very Chinese intonation that we're lacking here. But again, scale is the issue. If we can do this for one work, as you see it with the rhyme schemes, if we can do this for the Western Zhou Dynasty, if we can do it for the Han Dynasty, we can do it for any work of any size from any time period in Chinese history. And that's where it gets very exciting. All right. The second thing I want to briefly put forth to you, and I know we don't have very much time. So this is intertextuality, right? Hu Wanxing. It's the idea that we have correlations within texts and that the machines, the computers are actually very well suited to helping us find those correlations. So one of the first things that I did when I was working here in my current capacity was to talk to a group called the Artful Project. It's the textual optics project now as the larger umbrella and say, I see that you have an intertextual analyzer, essentially an algorithm that goes and finds all of the places that there are parallels within texts. And what they had was one working for French. My question was, could we use this on Chinese? And could we use this on Chinese at massive scale? And here, what we're talking about is the 24 Chinese histories. And it's about 40 million characters all in all. What happens when we look for intertextuality at scale? And the answer then is we get a huge, huge number of results. Uh, once again, I'm gonna try and jump out here into the actual algorithm. The, the easy way to think of it is to look at it as text. So when you run the search algorithm, you get 308,856 results. That's far, far too large to really get your head around as just a textual interface. So uh, in, par in partnership with Artful, I built a network visualization tool that allows us to take any number of texts and drop them in and see how they plot relative to each other. And here we can go ahead and zoom, we can move things around. Uh, let's go ahead and, and grab, let's grab the Hanshu real quick. When I click on the Hanshu, it over here on the left also shows me its connections to all of the other texts. So it tells me that there are 680 parallels between the Hanshu and the Sanguoju, right? Or 4,130 between the Hanshu and the whole Hanshu. That makes good sense. I also can come down to the bottom and see that the Shuji has 3,933 uh, essentially textual passages that are reflected in one way or another in the Hanshu. And the reason I say reflected in one way or another is because 
Uh, oh, sorry, we just refactored the algorithms, but we got a few more. It's 3,454 now. Um, what we're finding is not just exact citations. It's a fuzzy matching inference from the algorithm that can find overlaps of texts, even if the words are different from text to text. And that's where it gets most exciting. And I'll go ahead and leave you with this part of it where we do passage length, and we're gonna grab one of the longer passages here. And this again is, is only the Shuji versus the Hanshu. And the algorithm has decided these two, this here on the left is the Shuji, here on the right, this is a part of the Hanshu. It says these two are highly analogous, almost identical in fact. And how do we know? Well, if you scroll down and you click show differences, the algorithm can show us character by character where the, difference, where the differences are. And that's reflected in the green with the strike through. Those are things that were excised from the Hanshu. And here in blue, these are interpolations. These are places where Ban Gu essentially and his team changed the work of the Shiji. And yet look at how much light blue there is. It allows us to do intellectual history at scale. And it allows us to understand not just the words that were being copied or shared, but the ideas. Because then you can parse each of these intertextual uh, revelations is what we like to call them. And you can look at what were the main ideas being shared from work to work and uh, scholar to scholar. So essentially that's what we're doing here. Uh, you have a uh, nice link there through the text pair viewer into the algorithm. Feel free to use it on your own all you like. Uh, I think my time is just about up here. So I wanna leave you with a few last thoughts if that's okay. We are becoming much more a global society. And I think nowhere is this more true in some ways than, than Hong Kong, right? You feel it every day, the way that we as uh, inhabitants of this planet are working together in a variety of ways. And what we can do is we can see things in real time. We can see how, if you can especially read Chinese, how pe people are speaking to each other in Chinese. You can see it on a global scale with any language that you can put into any interface. We also have linked data connecting massive databases. And now we have new frameworks built on what's called deep learning that allows us not only to investigate these large previous uh, collections of databases and sources that we have, but even generate new ones in the fields of art, in the fields of music, video. We really are a global digital society with digital cultures at this point. And I'm delighted to be part of it and share a little bit of what we've been working on over here in early China with the rest of you. So thank you uh, in ancient Chinese, sluk, sluk. Thanks very much, Jeffrey. And let's go to James Lee and to a very, very different kind of application of digital technology. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Ken. So uh, Jeffrey is the uh, youngest of the three of us and uh, what he's presenting is uh, probably the most cutting edge in terms of uh, technology and the kinds of questions. Uh, mine is, uh, I'm the oldest by far and uh, the kind of uh, methods and uh, uh, things we do um, are, are therefore appreciably older. Uh, I'll be talking about big historical data and I'll be talking about particularly in your role in terms of its relationship to our understanding of inequality in Chinese perspective, since that's something I'm writing on now. I'm, I'm really happy, I should say, to uh, have a chance to communicate with the larger uh, sort of UC uh, um, audience because uh, I'm a second generation um, a Chicago uh, uh, PhD. My brother, younger brother, also went to Chicago. My dad went to Chicago. Uh, my uh, cousin went to Chicago. And uh, my niece is currently at Chicago. So we're one of those four generation uh, sort of uh, photographs you see in the back of the alumni magazine. Uh, so about 50 years ago, um, as a University of Chicago professor, Robert Fogel, 
uh, who later on, as the cover says, went on to win the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, sort of uh, launched the first big uh, historical micro-level data set kind of study with his book, Time on the Cross. Uh, and ever since his uh, work started, uh, the, you've had a series of uh, tomes where using big historical collections of micro-level individual data, much like the introduction of early technology at the advent of the scientific revolution, really sort of created a kind of social scientific uh, historical revolution in our understanding of the past. And it's especially true in economic history, Robert Fogel's uh, area, uh, historical demography, which is the area where I started off, uh, related social scientific history, especially in health. And uh, most notably, I think uh, recently, uh, building largely on Western European and North American data, we have the work of Thomas Piketty, uh, who has really uh, transformed our understanding of historical economic inequality and with implications for um, uh, the development of capital worldwide on into the 21st century. So what I want to do today is to introduce some of the recent achievements uh, uh, in this direction uh, by my own research group uh, and you know, creating and analyzing big historical data sets and organizing this new knowledge in a framework that encourages learning about Chinese inequality uh, and China in general and comparative perspective. And the point is to show that just as Bob Fogel transformed our understanding of American slavery, as Piketty has transformed our understanding worldwide of inequality. Uh, this work uh, put together is really beginning to also transform, I think, our understanding of Chinese inequality and uh, the nature of, as a result also of Chinese society. So the perspective that I'm presenting to you today comes from almost 40 years of empirical analyses of uh, people's lives, careers, property, uh, political authority based on about uh, almost 9 million records. We actually totaled all the uh, data uh, for the purpose of this, uh, uh, um, this presentation. And, and I was just saying to Ken that people love eight. And I was really astonished that the uh, total data set has 8,888,000 records. And I kept on writing to the, to the people in my research group, can't you guys produce another you know, 321 uh, 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 sort of data, you know, data points that I could have, you know, ba, 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 ba. <laughs> uh, but in other case, it's almost 9 million records, about 1.7 million uh, listed individuals. And if you include the related individuals quite often who are included in the record, it's about 2 million people in the past. And uh, these people, um, one million lived during the Qing Dynasty, one million lived during the Republic and the People's Republic, almost entirely from in the 20th century. Uh, one third lived uh, uh, in rural villages, largely in North and Northeast China. Two thirds lived throughout China, uh, in China's cities. Uh, and um, with these data, we can reconstruct the life course, uh, intergenerational, uh, sort of uh, uh, phenomenon behavior uh, and really get a, I think, develop a, an understanding of China based on this highly empirical sort of uh, approach to, to history, which uh, in the end, although it starts off really with a description of surface behavior, really gives us, I think, a much deeper understanding of, of China and Chinese history. One of the things we do do, uh, nothing as fancy as Jeffrey's stuff, is that at least we can, um, so we can at least uh, start to link across different data sets. So linking, for example, taking data sets from the Qing, start to link across different data sets. So linking, for example, taking data sets from the Qing, from uh, Chinese villages and then linking them to land reform, taking data sets from the Qing and then linking it to uh, data sets uh, uh, from um, of officials, uh, and then taking those data sets of officials in the Qing and linking them to data sets of officials in the Republican period, taking data sets of the officials in the Republican period, linking it to data sets from uh, of undergraduate records. So find them as their students and learn about their parents and their parents' occupation and their parents' ability to pay their tuition. Uh, taking them those people, looking at them from overseas, and then linking the data sets on um, 
various professional groups, whether it's certified accountants, uh, uh, engineers, uh, lawyers, health practitioners, uh, university employees, and so on, both in the Republican period and then also in the PRC. And so with these kinds of uh, materials, I and my colleagues from our, this is the current group uh, that work with us uh, uh, regularly. And as you'll see, we still have a number for, uh, Tsuyo is a UChicago undergrad. Uh, I think maybe took one of your courses, Ken, is that right? Um, and then uh, Xiangning is a current PhD student in history uh, at, uh, at Chicago. And so with them, we've established a number of important, I think, new facts about uh, Chinese inequality. Um, and I'm going to just summarize five and then show you, and then summarize sort of what the implications are, and that will take the rest of my time. So first at the, I think the thing we're probably still probably most well known for is our earlier challenging the Malthusian paradigm. We're very lucky that somebody 200 years ago, you know, said a lot of very influential things that turned out to be so incorrect about China, and so to reconstruct sort of the historical China, Chinese demographic system, uh, and, uh, you know, which has both uh, sex selective infanticide, uh, various sort of different uh, kinds of different patterns of, of survivorship, has really surprisingly low rates of reproduction among married couples, uh, has um, high rates of fictive kinship, partly therefore as a result, has very high rates of marriage, and then is tied to a system where a lot of behavior of individuals is controlled by family leaders or state leaders who are sort of making decisions, uh, not in response to the circumstances of the couple, but to larger political goals and economic social conditions that affect the family as a whole or the state as a whole. We then uh, uh, went on to take those insights and we had our own sort of series from MIT Press where we try to do similar work and compare them with villages uh, and individual level data from uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, from sort of Eastern Belgium, uh, from China, from uh, Romania and uh, um, uh, yeah, Rom uh, Emilio and Romania from uh, Fukushima in Japan and from uh, Southern Sweden. And largely we were able to demonstrate that mortality responses in fact uh, in Europe, we're actually conditioned by inequalities between households, but that both in uh, Fukushima and in our data sets uh, in North and Northeast China, they were conditioned largely by kinship, not inequalities, not between households, but within households. So uh, then we were able to show that at the national level, moving from social demography to education, we were able to show profound shifts uh, in the social and spatial origins of educational elites, from literati to professionals and to peasants and workers, and alternating from less concentrated to more concentrated regional origins in the uh, second half of the 20th century. In China, in this book, we're using uh, students from Peking University and from Suzhou University. And um, then from there with uh, uh, one of my Michigan PhD students who's now teaching at the University of Iowa, uh, uh, Chen Shuang, who uh, act, oddly enough was uh, working on a on a xian in China called Shuangchang, uh, we were able to show that the continued saliency of social organization of state-defined population categories, socially defined kin relations, and shaping sort of life chances of individuals, and how these kinds of relationships were at some level even more important than social relations, uh, like you know whether you were a, a peasant or a, or an official. And then we were able to move from that, finding other large data sets from land reform, from rural reconstruction, uh, and then from sort of the Chinese elite uh, sort of officialdom to show that uh, the persistent predominance at the national level of interlocking ladders for official appointments based on political entitlements on the one hand, merit examinations on the other, uh, and then of specific social and political configurations at the local level so I said even land reform and the very political legitimacy in this book, Power Over Property, uh, written by, uh, uh, again, one of my Michigan PhDs, Matthew Nolert, who is now an associate professor of economics at uh, Hitotsubashi University, that even the very political legitimacy, as I said, of the Communist Chinese Revolution is based as much on resolving local social and political injustice as on confronting um, Marxist economic injustice. 
So you really have uh, this kind of movement uh, from, um, uh, you know, from social demography to education, uh, to uh, state building, uh, to a rural revolution and rural reconstruction, uh, and then to uh, sort of who is the state. Now, what's interesting is we take all these five sort of very disparate discoveries, while they provide a multifaceted empirical based understanding of Chinese inequality, all of them, we're talking here about inequality, unlike the work of Piketty, ironically, even including land reform, which is supposed to be about redistributing property, they show that uh, in China, the inequality was as much about people and social relations as about property and economic relations. And so the, the underlying really sort of, I think, uh, importance of the work, in addition to sort of these empirical facts, is the perspective that in China, Chinese society and Chinese equality is not so much property-based as it is, say, in the US, as it is population-based. And um, that in the West, uh, you know, what uh, uh, Rafe Blofarm has called the great demarcation, and as Piketty now acknowledges, the, the invention of modern property rights and the registration of modern property records and property transactions and of state sort of extraction based on the accumulation of these data is the basis of, uh, of state building. But what's so striking is that in contrast, 70 years after land reform, the last time China has nationally tried to record who owns what, at least in, in the countryside, 40 years since the beginning of unprecedented global wealth creation, uh, the Chinese state has yet to even try to institute a comprehensive system of recording individual and household property and property transactions. So, you know, we know quite often where people are, who controls them, but we don't know what they have. And instead, as anyone who's lived in China or understands China, studies China, as Ken has, uh, as Jeffrey has, it knows the government has invested enormous effort not to record property, but to create a system of individual and household registration, organization, and even facial identification, so another kind of digital method, uh, that is the basis of Chinese state building and social control, and underlies much of Chinese social and spatial inequality. So the persistent divergence, therefore, that these sort of, you know, very disparate empirical works show of Chinese inequality from Western patterns of inequality. So one China, which is based on controlling people, the other sort of, uh, you know, an idealized West based more on controlling property, you know, really can show us that the global narratives and agendas of our new age of extremes, um, you know, truly should be tempered by recognizing the longstanding roots of alternative values institutions and behaviors that exist across much of the world. Now, I'm always struck by the fact that we constantly hear about the litany of the appreciation of diversity of the natural world uh, and of the cultural world, but never of human society and human values. So I think we show how in spite of tremendous strides in globalization, Chinese values, institutions, behaviors, they're more likely, you know, and this is really comes out of uh, this language really comes from, uh, from, uh, from Ken and his great divergence, you know, that we really have this persistent divergence here. And hopefully, therefore, you know, these kinds of big micro data, uh, humanities sort of digital uh, investigations can contribute, uh, you know, to a new global macro history and into perhaps, you know, even, and this may be sort of too optimistic, but a better mutual global understanding. So thank you. Thank you, James. And since James's work is the work presented that in this panel that's closest to mine, I can't help adding what I, part of what I find fascinating is the way in which this work has both given us different answers to questions that we knew we should be asking, and in some cases alerted us to questions that we didn't even realize we should be asking or thought it was impossible to ask. So to think about inequality, for instance, in earlier times, you know, not by a, a modern measure like per capita income, where the differences across societies are gonna be relatively small, but by asking a question like, how sensitive were families to the shock of a breadwinner dying? Now, that was just something we couldn't even think about asking until we had really good micro-level data sets. And yet 
in some ways, it's once you do it, it's almost obvious that that's a better way to think about inequality in a world where most people are poor than some of our old measures. But anyway, with that, let me turn things over to Susan. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining us. I guess I should say good evening to those of you on the other side of the world. Um, and thanks, of course, to Ken for organizing this great event. I wanna to talk today about historical GIS and spatial history. The terms digital history and digital humanities make many historians uneasy. We are trained and accustomed to doing archival research, uh, engaging in the critical reading of the sources we find within the archives and in the humanistic practices of interpretation and narration. Now, many people imagine that a digital project requires the kind of ma massive data sets that James Lee and his teams are working with, or with the development of new applications, new software, new platforms, such as Jeffrey um, described to us today. I wanna talk about a different kind of approach to digital methods, one that makes use of relatively small data sets consisting of hundreds or perhaps a few thousand pieces of information and one that makes use of open source or commercial GIS software to explore how space has shaped and been shaped by the process of historical change. Now this new attention to space as an historical actor is a relatively new development. History has long been a discipline organized around problems of temporality. Indeed, in helping my undergraduates conceptualize a research project, I, like many of my colleagues, tell them to design a project that allows them to explore change over time, a key phrase that captures the centrality of chronology to historical practice. Now, to be sure, this does not mean that historians have completely ignored issues of space or place. It would, after all, be a rare histori historical monograph that did not include at least one map although in many cases, such maps are a kind of after the fact addition that are used merely to orient readers in a very general non-specific way to the places where events are unfolding. Now, of course, there are historians who have focused specifically on the involving relationship between human actors and the environment, both the natural environment and the built environment in which human beings lived and work. And so here I'm thinking um, of works like William Cronin's Na Nature's Metropolis, which makes use of a rich array of spatial data to explore the relationship between Chicago as an urban space and rural spaces um, in the Midwest and the West in the 19th century. Now, even so, many historians still ignore space as a category of analysis and treat the movement of people, ideas, and goods and the divides of gender, class, race, and ethnicity without um, considering the spaces or places in which these um, social relations and events take place. Now that began to change, sorry, um, over a decade ago, when historians began to experiment with GIS technology to explore spatial change in the past, a landmark development was the founding of Stanford University's, shout out to our competitor, Spatial History Project in 2007. And in 2009, the Stanford Spatial History Project launched its Republic of Letters site. This was a landmark web-based project whose designers used mapping and network analysis to explore the formation and influence of knowledge-making communities that stretch from Europe to the Atlantic world and beyond in the early modern period. Now, programs such as QGIS, the open source software that I use, and ArcGIS, its commercial counterpart, part, facilitate smaller projects as well. They make it a relatively easy task, although there is certainly a bit of a learning curve to geo-reference historical maps and other represent space, represent space, representations of space, excuse me, such as aerial photographs to make them commensurate with geographically defined space 
and contemporary mapping conventions. By layering maps and other forms of spatial representations on top of each other, we can, for example, explore the deep history of a, of a particular site and how its natural and built environment changed over time. Or we can explore, for example, how administrative boundaries have shifted over time, why and to what effect in terms of people's conceptions of their own identity. Moreover, these programs also make it easy to visualize other kinds of information in relation to spatial units. For example, rates of disease, population change, crime, and all manner of uh, demographic information that has a spatial component can be mapped. Last quarter, I taught a course on the history of Tokyo. And as a class project, my students and I used QGIS to map information from the 1935 Japanese census on the residences of Koreans and Taiwanese, then colonial subjects of the Japanese empire in the city. Interestingly, what we discovered is that 1930s Tokyo contained no discernible ethnic enclaves. That is, there was no Korea town or Taiwan town in Tokyo. And in fact, Koreans and Taiwanese were widely dispersed around the city and its suburbs, living in what appear to have been majority Japanese neighborhoods. This discovery, as I'll term it, precipitated a lively conversation about how and under what conditions ethnic enclaves take form in cities and why they do not. Now this classroom exercise is suggestive of what I see as the real value of using GIS to do historical work. Historical GIS allows us to, to do more than simply visualize things we might have discovered via other means, utilized as a research tool, as an analytic tool. It allows us to see historical relations that might otherwise go unnoticed and to generate new questions that might otherwise go unasked. Now, in the time I have left, I want to talk very briefly about my current research project, which explores the process of medical modernization in Tokyo in the late 19th century. Beginning in the 1870s, the Japanese government laid out an ambitious agenda that aimed to replace traditional doctors, that is those, those trained in Sino-Japanese medicine, with a uh, new kind of doctor, those trained and licensed in what was known as Western medicine. They were also interested in creating new institutions, including public health hospitals and clinics, psychiatric hospitals, modern pharmacies, and these were all intended to improve the health of the Japanese people who were newly envisioned to be as valuable human capital for the nation state. Now, this plan was complicated by a series of devastating cholera epidemics in 1877, 1879, 1882, 1885. You get the idea, every three years, there was an outbreak of cholera. Uh, between 1877 and 1895, it's estimated that um, close to a half a million people died nationwide. Now, Tokyo was particularly hard hit in the 1882 uh, epidemic, more than 11% of cases were in Tokyo, although the city's population was only 3.2% of the country's total population, and this alarmed officials at all levels of government. Not only was Tokyo the most populous city in the country, it was also Japan's capital and the epicenter of the project of modernization undertaken by the government that had come into power only in 1868, and the city was intended to showcase the accomplishments of this new government centered on the figure of the Meiji Emperor. So I've been mapping various kinds of data that I have available related to cholera. And you can see here um, that, um, well, I'll show you this. This is uh, showing cholera prevalence in Tokyo in 1882. And then this is um, the same data map for 1886. And as these maps show, the disease uh, consistently over uh, the many epidemics of the late 19th century was far more prevalent in parts of the city than in others. In the repeated epidemics, Nihonbashi, Kanda, Kyobashi, and Fukagawa, this cluster of wards, um, 
in the um, uh, eastern part of the city um, had three to five times um, higher rates of cholera than other parts of the city. In fact, these four war wards of a total of 15 accounted for more than 50% of the total number of cases in the city in the 19th century. Now, these were the old commoner wards of the city and many of the poor and working class lived in tenement buildings known as Ura Nagaya. Uh, so here, I just wanna, uh, this is a quick map showing the uh, population density. And I hope you can notice that cholera based on my previous maps was more prevalent in the old um, um, commoner neighborhoods of the city um, and the most population dense um, parts of the city. Um, now, these old commoner wards, as I mentioned before, were characterized by tenement housing uh, that looked like this. So we see storefronts on the main streets. And then these were uh, one or two room apartments, uh, very small in terms of their area, and uh, a communal well and toilets um, in the center of these uh, buildings. Um, so these communal toilets were soon identified as a problem in the age of cholera. Um, each of them typically were shared by five or six families and they stood generally only a meter or two from the communal well. Uh, and this is a print of one of the um, sort of central parts of tenement houses. Uh, and you can see the well, the toilet and the garbage dump all in close proximity. Now, cholera is caused by Vibrio cholerae, which when ingested by human beings, causes explosive diarrhea and vomiting. Vibrio cholerae, the bacteria was only identified in 1884, but the relationship between the water supply and um, human waste and cholera had been recognized 30 years before this. And Tokyo's officials uh, reacted to this by blaming the city's poor for the spread of cholera. Their poor hygiene, it was charged, was infecting the city's water supply. As a result, public health measures targeted this population, subject, subjecting them to a host of new regulations that intervened in their everyday lives and domestic spaces. The police, for example, were authorized to inspect people's homes and toilet facilities to ensure that proper hygiene was being maintained. They were also empowered to inspect that people were following a new regulation, which required that the wooden waste receptacles traditionally used in toilets were replaced with costly but leak-proof ceramic containers. They were also required to do labor, including uh, dredging drains, cleaning streets, cleaning garbage dumps, and so on. In times of an outbreak, the households of an infected person were not only required to quarantine, but also to burn all the bedding and clothing of an infected person, requirements that were particularly burdensome for poor people. Now, as this map shows, in this period, slums were scattered around the city, and in many cases were adjacent to more prosperous neighborhoods. Now, unfortunately, the city compiled information only at the level of the ward, and so it's impossible to know if these neighborhoods and those adjacent to them suffered from higher rates of disease. But as the map shows, slum neighborhoods were prevalent in parts of the city that actually had very low rates of cholera. So the problem I want to suggest was not individual behavior, but rather the city's decaying water supply system. Tokyo's water supply relied upon an antiquated system of aqueducts that moved water uh, from um, a pond known as Inokashira Pond, located about 20 kilometers outside the city. And then it uh, entered a system of canals and bamboo and wooden pipes. And this moved it through the city. Um, and then eventually the excess spilled into the um, Sumida River. Uh, there was a second aqueduct that was called the Tamagawa Aqueduct that drew water uh, from the Tama River about 50 kilometers outside the city. And this entered into the more southern part of the city and supplied water to 
Akasaka, Azabu, Shiba, and other uh, wards. Now, testing of the city's water supply began in 1874 and continued throughout this period. There was no specific test for cholera and no set standards for water uh, purity, but whatever methodology was used, testing revealed that while re relatively pure at its source, the city's water grew increasingly contaminated with organic matter, including human sewage, as it moved through the city. And so I think this was the mechanism by which cholera was spread. So this is one of a series of maps that I've been making using the results of the various water quality tests carried out over the city. And as you can see, they consistently revealed higher rates of contamination at the end of the water system as we move closer to these um, wards that lay along the Sumida River. So although repeated um, studies exposed the contamination of the water supply, no sustained efforts were ever taken in the 19th century to address this critical infrastructure, primarily because the cash strap government, both at the national and the city level, had other priorities, including industrialization and expanding the country's um, uh, military. There were repeated plans for improvement of the water system um, that were drawn up, but the city's government instead placed responsibility for both cholera outbreaks and the control of cholera on the city's most vulnerable residents. This approach failed and cholera outbreaks continued until the early 20th century when construction of a modern water supply system and improvements, other improvements um, finally um, were effective at stopping the spread of cholera. So I'll end there, but I hope in this brief presentation that I've been able to suggest some of the possibilities of the use of historical GIS, which is um, a skill I think that every historian can make use of uh, and one that's relatively easily acquired. So thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thanks very much, Susan. Um, I guess I'd like to start with a sort of general question to the panel. Um, so we all know that one of the great things about all these methods is that they can often cause results to pop up that we just wouldn't have expected, that are big surprises. Um, surprises then encounter resistance from the other people in our fields who say, wait a minute, you know, I've been studying this for a long time. I never saw any evidence of that. Um, we also all know that the data that we have to work with has been unevenly recorded, right? And sometimes the best data we have is from a group that could be unrepresentative for the very same reasons that it's well recorded, right? Uh, most obvious with populations. Some people get surveyed and others don't, but also some texts get recorded and preserved, others don't. So I guess I'd like to ask each of you to talk about briefly about something you found that was a surprising result and how you reassured yourself that it wasn't an artifact of uneven preservation of the data you're working with. Um, anybody want to start? It's an easy question for me, Ken, because uh... There's so much ground in pre-modern Chinese that's never been trod, even by our greatest scholars, mm -hmm. uh, that it, essentially finding these types of sound patterns uh, has never been done at full scale. Mm -hmm. And part of that is just the arduous work of doing all of the phonology for every character in an entire text, or let alone one text. Imagine doing it for the entirety of pre-modern Chinese literature. And that's where these types of algorithms are a lifesaver, essentially, and open the door to certainly uh, research at scales we could never have approached before. And one of the things that we find, and this is what is most exciting to me, is that the world of stylistics in pre-modern Chinese literature is much greater and deeper than we ever imagined. 
And what I mean there is if you look very carefully at the Western Joe bronzes, the excavated manuscripts from the pre-modern uh, period, and I, here I mean the pre-Qin period, into the Han dynasty, into the Nanbei Chao, into the Tang and the Song, we find evidence for a wide number of modes of writing that have previously been undetected. There have been very, almost no scholarship on some of these modes of writing. Uh, prose poetry is, is the biggest one. Uh, and we've seen, uh, we had James Hightower and a few other scholars who worked on this, uh, both in the West and a number of great scholars in China, of course, but they didn't have these tools at their disposal. So they couldn't actually do all of the work it, that was required to figure out how the sound patterns were working in specific texts. They tended to be very general in their descriptions of how these things worked, right? We are now in a different era. We can do every graph in every text, understand it for itself, how it was working within the scansion of the text grammatically, how it was working semantically, and how it was working phonologically. So that becomes very exciting. Um, I'll pass to James and Susan. Um, Susan, do you wanna go first? Or? You go ahead. Okay. So I think in, in our cases, Ken knows, uh, we've been surprised quite often. <laughs> By the results, I think we've even written that uh, almost every major finding in you know, X volume was uh, against the original hypothesis we had when we wrote the grant. <laughs> and, uh, um, so what we, we've, I think as Ken knows, what we've done is uh, we've benefited at some level from uh, the example of Robert Fogel who really got burned, I think uh, with Time on the Cross uh, and at some level almost set the field back a little bit in terms of uh, appreciation of big data approaches. Uh, and, uh, you know, because uh, Fogel was, uh, of course, a, a great scholar, but he was also very much into personal aggrandizement. I hope I'm not uh, roughing any feathers uh, in the audience. And, you know, the, the time on the cross he arranged that uh, I think the week of the book came out that he would be on, uh, I think it was 2020. Uh, along with Kenneth Stamp, who had really very little to do with Time on the Cross, except that he was African-American. And uh, his field was, uh, he was a psychologist, right? And so, uh, um, yeah, and so, uh, so we, our, our main thing that we generally do is, uh, A, we're, we're very slow in publishing. As Ken knows, uh, we tend to circulate things a lot first in working papers, and we tend to attack ourselves by looking for other data sets to see if we find uh, anything at all uh, you know, different. And then when we try very hard, when we do publish to at least embed uh, what we have as much as we can in other data uh, to show whether it's, uh, you know, uh, if it uh, uh, is similar or dissimilar. Um, but I think that's the main thing. So we really, we tend to hold back and uh, to be pretty careful uh, before we actually come out with stuff. And, uh, and I think that's, especially as Ken says, where you can really upset people, especially when you're a junior assistant prof and your first book depends on the outside readers liking what you say, and then people getting really upset uh, by, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, E.A. Wrigley uh, recently passed away, but I mean, he was, he was Malthus's editor. He was personally insulted that we wanted to sort of, you know, rethink, uh, uh, you know, that Malthus would, you know, 200 years ago, would get it wrong about China. I mean, what's surprising about that? <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, so, um, Susan? Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> the, old, the old idea that your project is only as good as your data is, is I think um, quite true. And um, in my current project on public health in Tokyo, you know, I'm aided by the fact that they did gather a lot of information about different things. But as I suggested a few moments ago, um, the data they gathered and the questions that I want to pursue are sometimes mismatched. So, you know, I'm very interested in whether there were higher rates of cholera in slum neighborhoods, what are identified as slum neighborhoods. And of course, the data is at the ward, the level of the ward, not at the level of the neighborhood. And so I can't get as granular as I'd like to be. Um, and in other cases, 
Um, I'm, one of the, the things I'm looking at is a control of syphilis, which was a big problem in 19th century Tokyo. And the city officials um, treated the uh, prostitutes in the licensed brothels of the, of the city as the ones responsible for the disease. And so there's all manner of statistics about rates of syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases among that population, uh, but no information about um, how widespread syphilis was um, among people outside the, uh, the licensed brothels. Um, but I was able to discover a workaround and that is that um, there's a very lively culture of advertising among Tokyo's doctors, clinics and hospitals. And um, almost every hospital advertised in the newspapers of the day and they would lay claim to various specialties including the treatment of syphilis. So I was able to create a database of um, over a thousand hospitals in the city and um, the ones that um, advertise themselves as specializing in the treatment of syphilis and mapping them able to show that, you know, basically the city was filled with people offering to treat sexually transmitted diseases. And my conclusion is, you know, that that's really real evidence of um, how widespread the disease was among Tokyo residents. And I was actually able to identify a certain pattern. And that is that many hospitals and clinics that specialized in treating syphilis were close to military facilities and universities, both of which had largely uh, you know, male um, uh, residents. Um, so I think there's, there's um, problems with data, but one's also able to, to discover sort of new ways of, of um, you know, of workarounds, I guess I would say. Um, and that's been my approach. Thanks very much. Um, next question is a slightly modified version of one of our audience questions. And it's, you know, the phrase crisis of the humanities has been heard so often that it's a cliche at this point, but it also describes something real. Um, and what all of you are offering are ways to possibly surmount that crisis but ways that require humanists to do new things, ranging from pursuing certain kinds of large grants to getting, getting used to a culture in which co-authorship is the norm rather than the exception. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you see the kinds of methods you work with in relationship to the, the future for the humanities as a kind of institution. Uh, I tend to teach this on a regular basis, so this is a fun question for me. Uh, we have a digital studies program here at the University of Chicago. Uh, we're handing out MA degrees now to those who complete the program, plus we have a certificate for undergraduates and for PhD candidates who would like to essentially explore these exact questions. What do the machines bring to the study of the humanities? Uh, and as you say, uh, Ken, it's not just the humanities. There's a large amount of the social sciences that's involved in this. And frankly, the methods are often taken straight out of the hard sciences. So what we have really is a concerted effort to understand what is the role of the humanist in this new pantheon, right? In this new uh, global world of interconnected scholarship. And what we're finding is that there is a very key role that the humanities is playing, especially in the development of modern technologies. And I'll give a nod here to the development of AI. In my opinion, we're not there yet. Uh, I'm actually on record as saying that uh, I believe that I, AI will happen when a machine is able to redesign itself, when the computers can rewrite their own source code. That's AI. What we have right now is modeling. And what we have is a lot of math. And that's not the type of understanding that a humanist, that a scholar can bring to the study of these data sets. The other thing that comes along with that understanding is an understanding of ethics. Machines are calculators. They don't understand human ethical concerns. 
They don't understand human emotion. They don't understand why a poem written in the fourth century would still resonate today with all of us, right? They can mimic it, they can model it, they can even produce versions of it that are new, but they can't tell us why it matters. And that's the most important role, I think, for the humanities going forward, is not just to be essentially our, our traditional philologists, scholars of literature, language, and culture. It's to help sift through these new cultures and these new frontiers that we're building and understand them from a human perspective, from an ethical perspective, and see where are we going right and certainly places that we're going wrong. Well, so, you know, I, I started uh, my brief talk by talking about the sort of making the stretch uh, uh, analogy to the scientific revolution. But you really think of science before the scientific revolution, and it was all about uh, interpretation. It was very little about empirical investigation, because, you know, we knew the natural world and we only had to interpret it. And then uh, now uh, I think it'd be hard fought to go to a biology department and find a professor of biological theory or just chemical theory, you know, I mean, it was, uh, 90, usually there may be at best one theorist for every uh, 80 uh, empirical scientists. And so it took a long time to make that kind of transition, right? But I think uh, certainly digital and the kinds of questions we can do, uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely confident that either we will give up history to people in economics or in sociology or in the health sciences or in the natural sciences, or we're going to continue, then humanities will itself will have to change from its obsessive with the cultural turn, you know, uh, sort of a premature emphasis on interpretation uh, and its lack of respect really for sort of, uh, you know, for facts. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess in, in, in my own work, I tend to think of, of um, GIS and other digital tools as, as uh, part of uh, the toolkit of the historian. And so, you know, I don't see it as replacing sort of the conventional things that we do in terms of, you know, going to the archives, um, but it's a new way of processing the information we discover in them. And it's, uh, I think, um, offers us the possibility of, of working with um, larger sets of data and with greater accuracy than we, than we could, you know, without the tools. Um, I guess I would say one of the problems that, that I perceive uh, is that learning new tools uh, it takes time, right? I, I <laughs> slowed down my progress a lot to stop and, and learn how to use um, GIS. Um, and I think that, that the puts a particular burden upon younger scholars who are often under a great deal of pressure, um, even graduate students now, you know, we in my department require them to finish in seven years. And I believe it took me nine. Um, and that was without stopping to learn new technologies. Um, so I think in, in some ways we need to um, discover ways of um, giving people time to learn new tools and to you know, offer incentives, maybe encouragement um, for people to get beyond their comfort zone and to experiment. I was very lucky to be you know, well advanced in my career when I got interested in this stuff. Uh, but I, I don't think it should be that way. I think people, younger people should not be constrained um, by experimenting by sort of artificial time limits and the like. Yeah, I would say in that connection, one of my graduate students did Jeffrey's certificate in digital methods. And I think it's been both has improved his work and has certainly helped him on the job market. Um, but you know, it was, it was a tough choice. He had to choose between that and spending a bunch more time in the field. Um, yeah. those, are, those are tough trade-offs and I don't think our institutions are currently set up with enough flexibility to help people through those choices. I agree. 
Right. It also used to be that people who spend an enormous amount of time on language learning and on uh, learning how to read texts. And uh, now, especially one of the unfortunate things about digital methods is that it's so easy sometimes, Jeffrey, to not bother to read the text, just do a keyword count. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, yes, exactly. The, the thing is, and I, again, with all of our students, we have some very, very bright students who come in with the idea, I'm going to write an algorithm that's going to tell me everything I need to know about this text, right? Or this data source, whatever it is. The problem is that that's not true. No algorithm can tell you everything about it because there still remains an element of scholarship to the work, right? If it, we could do this all with machines, we would, and it would be fast and easy and we'd be done with it. But there's so much nuance, especially to textual information. We've got language, really philosophy, encoded in a linguistic framework words or in our case Chinese characters right it doesn't tell you where the text came from or why they wrote it it doesn't tell you why it was important then and why it's important today and it doesn't tell you a lot of the nuances and that's I think the work again of the scholar and this is why uh, despite all of the hand-wringing about the uh you know, the modern era, the humanities is going away, et cetera. I don't think so. I think what the humanities is going to do is take tools like these, broaden its essential its scope, and yet remain essentially the incisive scalpel to understand these sources in ways that the machines never will be able to. That's my opinion. Okay, I think we can maybe get one more question in. Um... And I guess it, I think it makes sense to talk about one that follows from the discussion that we've been having. Um, so Jeffrey just talked about the sort of the continuing role of the of the scholar in you know in doing what the machines can't do, right? In asking why questions, in thinking about the significance of these things. Does that point to any change in the way that academics have related to the more general public? Do we have to sort of re-explain ourselves in new terms or do we just sort of say, hey, here we are, we now have some cool new tools, but you know, essentially we're doing what we've always done. I think it can help and in that we now have avenues for production of knowledge that never existed before. And by that, I mean the internet writ large, mm -hmm. Twitter, social media. Uh, and uh, as my slide indicates, we are in a global information ecosystem now. We can talk to anyone anywhere in the world over the internet face to face with a camera. And that becomes important, I think, for those of us in the academy. We have to remember that our role is not just to feed the scholarship and, and essentially the, the publication industry that exists for academics. We have to remember that we're also here to serve the general public and help folks understand what these technologies can do, where their strengths lie, and, and frankly, where their weaknesses lie as well. And uh, we've had a little bit of luck in that area, but I would like to see more of it. I would like to see, of course, a greater connection between the average person, whether you're in Suzhou or in you know, Scranton, with the work going on in the academy, because a lot of it is actually quite relevant. A lot of it, these studies of culture, digital cultures, these studies of history, as, as James is doing, and uh, Susan's work with uh, what happened with the development of medicine, especially in Japan, these are critical for folks trying to understand our modern world. So how do we get them access? How do we make it accessible to them? I think is the big question there. So I think that, uh, you know, Jeffrey's really uh, hit something on the nail, which is also that um, uh, in this digital age, 
uh, our ability to take what we've done and to sort of uh, present it to a new kind of educated reader. So you, it used to be in my generation, uh, you were sort of brought up to the idea that the educated reader was your, was your audience. Uh, and then uh, with the cultural turn, it increasingly became a few experts uh, so to determine what the educated reader was really interested in. Uh, but now we have this kind of global audience. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, Ken's career, my own career has really shown that uh, the ability of uh, the larger actual educated reader to be interested and absorb and question uh, and appreciate different kinds of results, which may or may not always fit what the sort of, you know, the editors of three journals think is really important, uh, actually uh, has this ability to actually defeat, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, this kind of uh, hegemony of voice that uh, uh, was sort of an unfortunate result of the over-professionalization of the academy. And, uh, and I think that's uh, also been really important. Yeah. So I think even, you know, webinars like this, that anybody can log in from all over the world. I think that's, you know, we you couldn't do this before, right? I mean, it would just be people in Hyde Park that would listen. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I want to second that last comment by, by James, you know, that um, I've been really struck by how the term turn to webinars um, have made what were previously pretty exclusive campus-based events into something that attracts a much um, wider international audience, like like our event this evening, um, and we've seen that too. Um, I'm the director of the Center for East Asian Studies. That events that would get you know uh, 30 people on campus get 150 people uh, when they're on digital format, and I think that's a great development. In terms of of um, my work, which I you know, it's really visual in its nature. Um, it's made me think about the, um, the continued valorization among scholars of my generation with the book, with the printed mm -hmm. product as the expected and valuable output of our research activities. Um, and I think, I know with many of my students, unlike me, my first thing is to like go to the library and look for a book that they go to the web. That's their, their first order of seeking information. And I think you know, it requires us to think about how to take the products of our work and make it available to an audience that is not going to a library, but going to the web. Um, and when I first conceived of my Tokyo project, um, because I intended it to be you know, a kind of cartogra cartographical project, that it would be a web-based thing. Uh, and then people, my my friends in the field were like, oh, you don't want to waste it on the web. You want to do the proper thing and bring out a book. And so I think that's the kind of cultural, cultural mm -hmm. turn that we need to negotiate where not every project has to end in a book or it's not valuable to the field. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to put a quick plug in here. Uh, one of the questions now for the Modern Academy is, do data sets and new databases represent publications? And as we, those of us in this field know, a really good database, a really good data set, well curated, takes many years of effort, often more effort than a monograph. And yet it's not often recognized for the, the real import that it will have uh, on the field, so. Absolutely. I, I think I'd add to that, that I think yet another value of this kind of work in particular is to help bridge a sort of unfortunate divide that exists both in the academy and I think in the general public, which is there's a tendency to think that on the one hand, there is science with a capital S that is, you know, as objective as a Euclidean proof. And then there's this other stuff, which depending on which side of the two cultures you, you're on is either what's truly exciting or it's just a matter of opinion. 
And I think, you know, what we in the social sciences and humanities are in the business of is something that's in between, right? Some, some kind of well-informed judgment that no can't be regarded as, as rock solid as a Euclidean proof, but is, is in a realm where we can say that argument is better than this one. And it's not the case that there's science capital S and then everything else is just a matter of opinion. And what I think the mix of more traditional humanistic methods and the kind of technological stuff that people like you are doing is helping us remind people that that sort of realm of judgment exists and it's important. And we wanna help people get good at it. Um, I, my father spent his whole career as a neurophysiologist. So we have lots of conversations about the way language works in the brain. And the most amazing thing to me is that he said, you know, you can measure parts of the brain. You can measure the way the neurons are firing. But then there's a layer of interpretation and every great scientist will admit to this, that once you get to essentially the end of the number crunching, you still have to interpret what it means. Mm -hmm. And so making uh, the general public aware that capital S science still involves a layer of interpretation. And frankly, the humanities and social sciences, as much as, as James says, interpretation has been the, the byword, rest also on the same solid underpinnings of evidence, evidential scholarship and data that the sciences do. Right, and convincing the, the humanist that the good scientist is not their enemy, because the good scientist <laughs> right. doesn't no. know that there's a realm of interpretation. Yeah. Of course. It's a kind of caricature scientist and for that matter, a caricature humanist. Indeed. Um, we have run past our allotted time. A lot of our audience is still with us, but I'm cognizant of the fact that it's getting late in Asia and also that it's getting into the regular workday here in Chicago. So I think I'd like to wrap this up. <laughs> Thanks very much to our panelists and to our audience. Um, there is a poll coming up. Um, but thank you and good evening or good morning. Take care. And for doing this and thank you, uh, you know, your office too, uh, for all the early efforts. So Mark, I'm passing things back to you. Thank you, Ken. And thanks professors uh, Burns, Lee and Tharson for sharing all your detailed knowledge. I really enjoyed the part of the conversation that veered away from a little bit of the uh, uh, expertise and how you're leveraging technology in your area and talked about some of the bigger and deeper questions. I hope we can do that again um, soon. We, as Ken mentioned, we have a brief poll on the program for tonight for the audience on Zoom. If you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, you can leave your answers to the poll questions um, in the comment section. And while you're answering the poll uh, and completing that survey, let me tell you a little bit more about what's coming up with our upcoming programs. Um, episode four of our COVID Life series will be next Thursday. April 21st, um, and I want to emphasize this is at 10 a.m. Hong Kong time, um, not in the evening. So 10 a.m. Hong Kong time. Once again, we're going to have uh, Professor Ariel Khalil, the Daniel Levin Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy Studies. She'll moderate a panel this time. Last week, we heard about her uh, recently published research. Um, next week, she'll moderate a panel of experts on child development and how COVID impacts early child development. So um, I hope you can join us for that program. Um, make sure you follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and our new LinkedIn uh, uh, site. And also uh, check out our UN Campus website for all of our programs and information about things going on on the UN Campus in Hong Kong. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful day or evening, wherever you may be.